This video is brought to you by Squarespace. Before I get started with part two of this three-part series that will cover picks 11 through 20 of the 2022 NFL Draft, I want to remind you guys of how this is going to work. On your screen now, you can see the grades I gave to each first round pick separated by tier, but this isn't meant to revolve around grades. I'll tell you what I thought of each player when I turned on the tape, but the function of this project is to help you guys understand what each team is getting in their first round pick. If you have any questions about my grading system or prospects who are picked later than the first round, please feel free to shoot me a DM on Twitter, and I'll do my best to answer every question I can. You're going to hear me reference a lot of stats and measurements in this video, and I'll attach links in the description to sources for that information. Also, those of you who stick around till the end will get a special offer from the sponsor of today's video, Squarespace. But if you're just here for your favorite team's pick, head down to the description for timestamps. But let's kick this off with the New Orleans Saints, who at number 11 overall took Chris Olave, wide receiver, Ohio State. Watching Ohio State's offense was really interesting because they had three rare talents at receiver, Garrett Wilson, Chris Olave, and Jackson Smith and Jigba. And all three of them are elite separators, but each have a different way of separating. With Wilson, it's explosiveness and agility combined with his ability to exploit the defender's blind spot. But with Olave, it's all about body language. During the stem portion of his routes, you'll see him do subtle things like put his head down or put his arm up in the air or start to look back for the ball, all of which are meant to throw off the defensive back. I don't think he has the same athletic gifts as Wilson, but he's been able to produce pretty similar numbers in the same offense because of the creative approach he takes to route running. On top of all of that, Olave ran a 4.38 second 40 at the combine, so part of the reason why he's so good at selling the go or fade downfield is because DBs are scared of that speed. I think Olave will be a great compliment to his new teammate and fellow Ohio State alum Michael Thomas in New Orleans because there's a vertical element to Olave's game that you don't really have with Thomas. Thomas. I had higher grades on a few other receivers because I don't see Olave as a very high ceiling player. He can separate, but he doesn't do everything else well enough to be a well-rounded number one in the NFL. Despite the 4-4 speed, Olave isn't special after the catch, and his hands are good, but his lack of explosiveness will prevent him from winning a lot of jump balls at the next level. He's one of the safest picks in this draft, and he'll make a great number two or number three option in this Saints offense. At number 12 overall, the Detroit Lions selected Jamison Williams, wide receiver, Alabama. How insane is it that picks number 10, 11, and 12 were all in the same receiver room at Ohio State just over a year ago? Like I said last time, Brian Hartline deserves a massive raise. Williams transferred to Alabama before the 2021 season, and it was the right move because he put together a really impressive breakout year. He's a player who I've already covered during the draft process, so I won't spend too much time on the pick, but if you want to know more about his game, check out that video from back in March. To summarize what I saw on tape though, Williams is more than just a vertical threat. His nuanced approach to route running is a great complement to the 4-3 speed he displays on tape, which is why he's one of the better separators in this class. I think this was a great move, and it speaks to Detroit's priorities in the team building process. Last year they went offensive line with Pinay Sewell, then this year they go pass rusher and than receivers, so they're not rushing to pick a franchise quarterback. The right guy will come along, and in the meantime, Detroit is building a really solid foundation of young players. At number 13 overall, the Philadelphia Eagles selected Jordan Davis, defensive tackle, Georgia. It depends on how you look at it, but I think there's an argument to be made for Jordan Davis being the best athlete in the NFL right now. At the combine, he measured in at a little over 6'6", 341 pounds, with 34-inch arms. Just a monster of a man. Then he tested in the 99th percentile in the broad jump, the 97th percentile in the 40-yard dash, and the 80th percentile in the vertical. That just shouldn't be possible for a guy who's this freakishly huge. Georgia's 2021 defense produced five first round picks in this 2022 draft alone, and in my opinion, Davis is the best of all of them. He's one of those very few players who projects as a two-gapping nose tackle at the next level, and the value that a two-gapper brings to a modern NFL defense is massive. Two high safety covered shells are becoming more and more popular among NFL defenses, and to thrive in a two high structure, the front has to hold their own against the run. If you don't believe me, just watch the LA Chargers last season. Philly played out of a two high shell at an above average rate in 2021, and I think that putting Davis on the field will bring that rate up even more in 2022. The main concern with Davis in the pre-draft process was snap counts. 
He was only on the field about 40% of the time last season, and there's a couple different reasons for why his snap counts were so low. Davis dropped around 20 pounds for the combine, so he was playing at more like 360 last year, and at that weight, fatigue is inevitable. Combine that with the lack of the threat Davis brings as a pass rusher and Georgia's insane depth on the defensive line, and Davis becomes a two-down player. Based on what I saw on tape, Davis's difficulty as a pass rusher had much more to do with his explosiveness off the line of scrimmage than anything else which is confusing because he tested very well at the combine in explosiveness drills. So I think that if Davis can avoid fatigue by playing at 340 and his coaches can help him improve his get-off, he can be even better than Fletcher Cox. Nose tackle is one of the least glamorous positions on the football field, and they take a notoriously long time to develop. So don't expect immediate dominance from Davis from the moment he sets foot on the field, but I think that in time, he'll become the glue that holds a very good Eagles defense together. At number 14 overall, the Ravens took Kyle Hamilton, safety, Notre Dame. Early on in the draft process, Hamilton seemed like a lock to be a top 5 overall pick. But his stock fell over the past few months, and that had a lot to do with his 4.59 second 40 at the Combine. I personally thought that Hamilton played much faster than that, and that could have to do with the fact that I watched him before the Combine, so I went into his evaluation without any source of bias. It wasn't until late in the draft process that I actually watched the video of Hamilton's 40, and that's when I saw that he didn't run in a straight line at all. Then I saw a tweet from Mike Renner of PFF saying that Hamilton's flying 20, which is the last 20 yards of the 40-yard dash, was just three hundredths of a second off of Lewis Seens, who ran a 4.37. So once he actually started to run in a straight line, he was as fast as we expected. Based on what I saw on tape, Hamilton has sideline-to-sideline -side range, and his trigger is good enough to pull Play either in the deep middle or in the box. His hips might not be fluid enough to hold up in man coverage against receivers, but he's big enough to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with physical tight ends. I'm not sure what Mike McDonald's defense will look like in Baltimore next year, but I like the fit because Baltimore has the personnel to keep the pressure off Hamilton early on. They already have Marlon Humphrey and Marcus Peters on the outside, then they've got Marcus Williams and Chuck Clark at safety so Hamilton won't be forced into a specific role from day one. I did cover Hamilton more in depth earlier in the draft process, so if you want to know more about what he brings to the table, check that video out. At 15 overall, the Houston Texans selected Kenyon Green, offensive guard, Texas A&M. I had a higher grade on Zion Johnson, so I didn't agree with this pick, but I don't hate it at all. Green has been labeled as one of the more versatile offensive linemen in the class because he has the experience playing every position on the offensive line aside from center, but I don't think that's why he was picked so early. Based on what I saw on tape, Green didn't start to look like a first or second round pick until he was locked in at left guard. He was okay at tackle, but I don't see him as a player who can be plugged into multiple positions on the offensive line. The good news is, Houston doesn't need him to be that kind of player. He can play left guard day one, which will let Titus Howard go back to right tackle, which is where he's performed best. So this is a pick that should really improve the performance of Houston's offensive line as a whole. At number 16 overall, the Washington Commanders selected Jahan Dotson, wide receiver, Penn State. I see Dotson as a player who can be plugged in at slot receiver and produce really solid numbers from day one. He runs really fluid routes, he's probably the most sure-handed receiver in this entire class, and he can make plays after the catch. I think projecting him to be a true number one is optimistic because he doesn't have the size or the strength to outmuscle press coverage at the line of scrimmage, and he struggles to stack corners over the top. But his short area quickness is impressive, which translates to precise routes in the short and intermediate areas of the field and missed tackles forced after the catch. When he gets the ball in his hands, Dotson looks like he's returning a punt. He's got great vision, and there's a noticeable burst of speed when he turns upfield. Despite his relatively small frame, Dotson displays impressive ball skills and body control, so for a player who projects as a slot receiver, his ball skills are very good. Because my grade on Dotson was slightly lower than other available receivers, I don't see him as a great value at 16 overall, but I like the fact that Washington is stocking up on weapons in preparation for a young quarterback to take over down the road. At number 17 overall, the LA Chargers selected Zion Johnson, offensive guard, Boston College. BC's zone-heavy scheme was a perfect fit for Johnson because he's at his best when he's on the move. There are no wasted movements, no false steps, and his explosiveness allows him to reach defenders with a leverage advantage. He packs a strong punch, maintains good pad level and a wide base in pass protection, and can drop a solid anchor against rushers who try to win with power through his chest. Johnson is one of the very few offensive linemen in this draft who offer true positional versatility. 
In 2020, he was a full-time starter at left tackle and put out some really solid tape. Then in 2021, he played full-time at left guard and was even better than the year before. And as much as I like what I see on tape from Johnson, what I've heard about who he is off the field is even more impressive. He was an unrated prospect out of high school, took his only D1 offer to Davidson College, played two seasons there before transferring to Boston College, and played in 36 games in his three years there. At the Senior Bowl, he was staying after practice to put in extra work every day, and made an effort to take snaps at center, the only position he didn't play in college, as a way of telling coaches that he's willing and able to play wherever he's needed. The only real concern I have with Johnson moving forward is the inconsistency he displayed in stunt pickup. He tends to get tunnel vision on one pass rusher, which he occasionally pays for when the opposing defensive line stunts to his side. He'll make a great addition to the Chargers offensive line both as a starter and for depth because of his versatility. At number 18 overall, the Tennessee Titans selected Traylon Burks, wide receiver, Arkansas. If you haven't watched Traylon Burks play football, you're missing out. At 6'2", 225, Burks has a rare combination of size and speed. Even though he ran a 4'5 at the combine, his game speed is much faster than that. And if you don't believe me, just watch. To an extent, Arkansas's offense revolved around getting the ball in Burks' hands, and that's one of the reasons why he played primarily in the slot. The closer he aligned to the ball, the easier it was to get it to him. When Burks did get snaps on the outside, he displayed the ability to win at the line of scrimmage and stack downfield, but the sample size of that actually happening was small because that wasn't his role in this offense. Now, the issue with Burks is that he doesn't fit the mold of an NFL receiver. His route tree was relatively limited in college and will be limited at the next level as well because the ability to throttle down and explode out of a break just isn't there. He tested very poorly in the three-cone drill, which doesn't surprise me after watching his tape because he's a stiff athlete. The plan for Burks is to be the replacement for A.J. Brown, and while he obviously isn't going to bring what Brown brought, he is the most similar receiver to Brown in this draft. They share that size, speed, yards after catch combination that not a lot of guys bring to the table, so I think Tennessee will be a good fit for Burks, and he gives the Titans their best shot at replacing their former number one receiver. At number 19 overall, the New Orleans Saints selected Trevor Penning, offensive tackle, Northern Iowa. Penning really made a name for himself at the Senior Bowl when he was throwing pass rushers into his quarterback and picking as many fights as possible, and if you go back and watch his tape from last season, you can see why that was the case. He's an absolute mauler in the run game. He's an angry football player who plays through the whistle, and his athletic profile is among the best in this class stacked with freak athletes. He tested in the 97th percentile in the 40, the 98th percentile in the three cone drill, and the 89th percentile in the broad jump. Traits wise, there isn't another player in this class who comes close, but Penning is really raw in pass protection. As an unranked tight end prospect out of Newman Catholic High School in Iowa, Penning had just two offers to Division I programs. When he arrived at UNI, he was just 235 pounds, and he spent his redshirt season gaining weight to switch to the offensive line. A few years later, Penning is up to 325 pounds, and is now one of the most athletic big men the league has to offer. It's probably going to be a long time before Penning is a capable pass protector, but I know he's working with private offensive line coach Duke Manyweather, who's the best in the business when it comes to offensive line development. So it's clear that Penning wants to be great, even if he's a traits projection at the moment. At number 20 overall, the Pittsburgh Steelers selected Kenny Pickett, quarterback, University of Pittsburgh. It took way longer than we expected, but the first quarterback finally went off the board at pick 20. And I don't think it's a huge surprise that it's Pickett. Aside from the fact that he's already a Pittsburgh legend, he's the most NFL-ready quarterback in this class. He's accurate from both within the pocket and on the move, and he's a really good athlete. He has the arm strength to zip the ball into an out or curl route from the far hash, and the mobility to keep plays alive. When he doesn't have anything open downfield, he can extend the play, operate outside of structure, and make plays even when the defense does everything right. As for what Pickett needs to improve, pocket presence is at the top of the list. It's probably a long-lasting symptom of subpar offensive line play, but Pickett tends to get really antsy in the pocket. He'll sometimes step up too early or leave a clean pocket altogether, so he's going to need to improve his pocket presence moving forward. He's also a bit inconsistent in his progression speed, but that should improve with NFL coaching and more trust in his offensive line. I expect him to win the starting job in Pittsburgh next year, and my only concern for how that'll impact his development is the level of offensive line play. If Pittsburgh's offensive line is as bad as it was last 
last year, Pickett's bad habits will only get worse. So I think under the right circumstances, he's ready to start. But Pittsburgh may not be able to offer those circumstances by week one of the 2022 season. Before I go, I'd like to share a word from the sponsor of today's video, Squarespace. If you have a business or are interested in starting one, Squarespace is a phenomenal resource for building your online presence. It's an all-in-one platform that can help you get your brand off the ground or take your business to the next level by building a website. What you see on your screen now is the site I created for my brand, and this was all done in under two hours. It's a really user-friendly service and offers tons of tools that can help you do whatever it is you want to do with a website. Personally, for now, I'm using it as a gallery to showcase my work on YouTube, so on the homepage, you can see my recent videos. Squarespace also offers an email marketing service, and it provides a platform to sell a product. Whatever you want to do to grow your brand, and wherever you are in the process, Squarespace has a service for you. So check out squarespace.com for a free 14-day trial. Then, when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash billystevens to get 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Again, that's squarespace.com slash billystevens for 10% off your first purchase. But that's going to do it for part two of this three-part series. If you'd like to support the channel, you can check out my Twitter and Patreon at the links in the description. But that's all I've got for now. So until next time, later.